Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited for today's guest. Today's guest is Dr. Rahul Jandial. Dr. Jandial is a dual-trained brain surgeon and neuroscientist at City of Hope in Los Angeles, California. In his latest book, Neurofitness, The Real Science of Peak Performance from a College Dropout Turned Brain Surgeon, Dr. Jean Dial pulls together years of research from various fields, surgery, science, brain structure, the conscious mind, and applies them to everyday life for enhanced performance, improved memory, heightened creativity, and much more. Before we, we begin the show, I want to tell you guys about the Ancestral Health Symposium. This is one of my favorite conferences of the year, and this year is going to be held in sunny San Diego. Please click on the link to see all the awesome speakers that are going to be presenting in this cutting-edge, evidence-based evolutionary health conference. Before we begin the show, let's hear from a sponsor, Integrative Health. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I'd love to take just a moment and tell you about our Thyroid Advisor program. So what is a Thyroid Advisor visit? Well, imagine that one of your closest friends happened to be a thyroid doctor and that they understood the conventional, the naturopathic, and all the functional approaches. You know, they just wanted you to feel better and they were happy to video chat whenever you needed them. So that's basically it. Just click the link to set up a time and the IH docs are happy to help out today. Hello, everyone. Super excited to have Dr. Jan Dial with me right now. You know, we're recording. Uh, he's in San Diego. I'm getting back from Paleo FX. Super amazing uh, conference. Tons of friends. Just having so much fun helping people get better. But for those of you that you're not familiar with Dr. Jan Dial's work, what is your hero story? How did you go from being, you know, just a student and then ended up, you know, cutting into people's uh, skulls and examining their brains? Yeah, I've got an unconventional story. And, you know, I don't know if it's a hero story, but it's my story. I dropped out of college actually from UC Berkeley for a couple of years and was working as a security guard. And then uh, my mother at that time, she was in her 40s, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And back then, the word cancer was just completely, you know, unshared, unheard of, even though it was around. And she's doing fine. She's great. She's living with me now. And uh, I also fell in love around that time. And so I started uh, my, my pivot, my long crawl back to finishing college and got into medical school and then got into brain surgery training. And then I took some more time off, another couple of years to get a PhD because you know, the brain, yes, it is a material object that can be manipulated and, you know, tinkered with and sculpted, if you will. But it's also this sort of like heavenly flesh that has a biological element and sprouts consciousness. So it has to be understood through science as well. So I finished in my 30s. I'm in my mid 40s now with an MD in neurosurgery and a PhD in, in neuroscience. And I got a job here in Los Angeles at City of Hope Cancer Center. So I'm not in San Diego anymore. And uh, in the last 10 years, I've, uh, I've grown quite a bit through the experience of taking care of patients and learned a lot about life and story and narrative. And, and that's where I'm at. I've got three teenage kids. There's no greater lesson than being a parent. <laughs> so, and that's, uh, that's how I got here. And that's where I'm at for now. You have a new book, Neurofitness, the real science of peak performance, and I, I want to, I want to talk about some topics from the book. But you know what? Why, why were you, uh, why were you inclined to put this information out? And you know, you, you have a pretty good reach. You know, you, you've done documentaries uh, for National Geographic, and you know, what's like the, because this is your like your baby. You know, uh, what was the focus of it, or or how did you go about sitting down and you know putting uh, fingers to the keyboard? Yeah, I mean, to be indelicate for the last 10 years, a lot of what I was seeing about the brain was just bullshit. I mean, I was just perplexed where you, I would hear things like, this is where happiness lives in the brain. This is where fashion can be found in the brain or how to rewire your brain with a certain food or meditation technique in Malibu. I, you know, there's just too much 
room for manipulation. One, we all have brains, so everybody is kind of a brain expert, and they've started to declare themselves that. And then two, the simplistic view of the brain was not what I was seeing in surgery, after surgery, patients with injury, patients without injury, and not what I was seeing when I was reading the hardcore neuroscience journals. One, there's a lot of baloney out there, and two, the real magic of it wasn't getting out because it was all the, the content, you know, the bandwidth was clogged with sort of little cheesy digestible pearls and anything it is. But did you know that we only use 20% of our brain? And, and Einstein used 25% of the brain. So we can un- uncouple that 5%. We will all be Einsteins. Uh, I mean, I like you and I've just met you. But again, that's... that's that was completely tongue in cheek. Okay, I didn't get it because I thought, oh shit, he's starting off no, with no, the baloney. No, 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 like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious, actually. I was like, oh, boy. You know, I, with my podcast, w- one of my taglines is, I ask the stupid questions so you don't have to. And like, seriously, it's one of those things that people say over and over and it's memed. And I'm like, Jesus, you know? I know, because... I- I was thinking, oh boy, we're, we're not, we're not going to get along from the start because I, I got to shatter some thoughts here. But, you know, it is ridiculous, but it's not because they made that movie. It's not true, but somehow that kind of thing got woven into the fabric of our thinking all the way to Hollywood where they made that movie with Scarlett Johansson called um, Lucy. Yeah, yeah, with the pill. Well, that was, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bradley Cooper with the pill, Limitless. And then Lucy with, she harnessed the rest of her brain but <laughs> i mean it's it's a billion dollar myth but uh what i've seen is you know we put wires on the skull all different corners light up all the different time and then we've got all these amazing brain scans that show like aurora borealis all corners of the brain are used you know it wants to be efficient it's not going to go 100 miles per hour all the time for all its activities it burns a lot of fuel so maybe that's where they got that myth but exactly tongue in cheek was perfect there where yeah, that kind of stuff is nonsense. And like you said, you know, we have a brain, so we're all neuroscientists, you know, or we pretend, you know. I was talking to one of my friends, Aero Blydesdale. We were discussing how kids start experimenting, you know, uh, as a toddler. You know, they, they, they throw things out the table, you know, because they're scientists and they want to see cause and effect, you know. So we are this innate scientist, but at some point we get confused by noise and signal and we create these myths that sound really cool. You know, like imagine if you could uncover or unlatch the other 5% of your brain and, you know, but that, that's a really easy place to insert drug, insert supplement, insert biohack in order to achieve that extra 5%. So, so you can run with the story and people that, that are just passing by or listen to this message and, and it sounds really cool and they try it and it's bullshit. Or placebo. Well, placebo is, is fantastic. It's placebo. We'll get to that a little bit later, but I don't fail to understand why it works to come up with simple bullets, little headlines, little posts, little tweets. They work. They work with our attention span. They make a, a broad statement that is easy to hold on to. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just let's leave that for other disciplines other than the most complicated thing in the universe, which is the human brain. And do you really want to dumb down the potential by not spending a little bit time thinking about the brain, your brain? I think that's it's too much of a shortcut. You want to say things like, you know, muscle memory for your body or for your knee. And if you want to even start talking about like probiotics for your gut, and you want to simplify that, simplify that, you know, that's okay to me. But simplifying the human brain to where it's cartoonish. And it's overly simplified to where it's naive. Why would you want to do that? You're just tricking yourself. So before we go into parts of the book that you know that that like geek me out, you know, uh, let's talk. Let's talk about biohacks. You know, I I think that in computer systems, when you hack a computer, you are exploiting a system, but it's like very algorithmic. You your input is going to predict the output, and when in in human bodies are not like that. So I'm really interested about in, in talking about nootropics and uh, smart drugs, but I, I love that part when you talk about Adderall and you say, okay, so yeah, so it might be, it might have some effects in focus and being able to complete a task, but so is sleep. 
<laughs> you know, where Adderall is the biohack that can have so many side effects, you know, from uh, palpitations and anxiety and uh, to, uh, you know, long lasting effects in your heart, you know, where you can achieve the same stuff with without the biohack with sleeping. So wh- how do you feel about like biohacking? Well, biohack, that, that's an interesting thing. So first, the, the language we use reflects our time, you know, like decades ago or a century ago, the brain was gears or, and, you know, thousands of years ago, or hundreds of years ago was this like ether that was floating through. And then, you know, it was machines and then it's now computer based references. And, you know, a hack being a shortcut, one exists for the brain, like with devices and stuff like that, because what's happening is these single electrode things that are sold or these magic caps, they are again using a shortcut that it does not exist when you look at it in the medical and scientific community. Yes, we can detect your brain waves, but it's hard to do with one little electrode on your forehead. You know, you got to put this huge grid on, you got to be in there for hours. So it takes an existing technology in the medical and surgical world and comes up with like a shortcut for it. And those I don't believe in. On the other side, the electricity in our brain is a result of chemicals. So much like a battery has chemicals that are separated. You ever think about that? It's a battery. The, the gradient, the, the ion gradient, yeah. Yeah, so electrochemicals. So if you have chemicals that are split apart, when they want to run toward each other because they have opposite charges, that can spark electricity, okay? That's how brain cells, brain tissue, sparks electricity. So I do believe... I don't know. I don't want to use the word biohack, but drugs absolutely change the brain, change the chemistry, change your thoughts, change your feelings, and can sometimes, depending on what your creative or productivity goal is, enhance your production, uh, enhance your productivity, and even help you think differently. So I'm not anti-drug. What I am is just realizing the nature of the drug you're using and not giving it more credit than it deserves, and also not taking away and forgetting about the risks that it poses. So Adderall, back to that, when we were in college, we did ephedrine, which was legal back then until they started turning it into crystal meth. You could buy it at 7-Eleven, and it was it was like coffee. It lasted a little longer, and you, you could see why sometimes a little bit of a stimulant can actually take away anxiety and jitters, but then just right off that cliff is a lot more anxiety, a lot more jitter. So part of the problem is we can't deliver it in the smart way. But after all, here and there, think of it as an extra cup of coffee without the jitters that might help you focus if you're studying at the end of the day or you're tired and you haven't caught up on sleep and you're looking for a shortcut. You know, people use it in college, a lot of kids. I don't think it's inherently dangerous, but it has an addict potential, and if you have mental health issues, it can mess with your, uh, you know, neurochemistry. So that's my thought about Adderall as a biohack. And, and you know, in all of this eans, all of this, you know, caffeine, nicotine, you know, all these alkaloids, they exist in nature as insecticides. And uh, I did a talk at the Ancestral Health Symposium about how humans – search for these things and, you know, like smoking tobacco or chewing ephedra in, you know, in the desert, because at the doses found in nature, they repel insects. But at the doses like caffeine found in plants, we pamper the plant and it aids in their evolution. So it's it's a mutual beneficial thing. You know, we drink the coffee and then we take care of you so you can give me more coffee. So there's this symbiotic relationship. There is. Yeah, very well documented, even in nature, where where deer search for tobacco plants and then they spread the seed after eating it. You know, so so these insecticides in in they have a benefit to us. So let's talk about these in, insecticides. Can you can you tell my audience because I, uh, your book is fantastic? Can you tell them your beer? Coffee strategy for uh, for the brain. <laughs> That's that was oh, awesome. Yeah, that I was one. reading it. I was like, dude, I gotta try this. Yeah, well, you know, the, I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not in the literary world, but, you know, I think a lot of American Pulitzer Prize winners were actually alcoholics. Now, <laughs> that reference is like saying, you know, a lot of creative geniuses were bi- had bipolar disorders. I always say that is most of the alcoholics I know and have met 
are, are not uh, literary giants. And most of the people that I've met with bipolar disorder are not living some creative life with breakthroughs. Ben, whether it's connected, nobody knows. But alcohol and caffeine is an interesting thing. We all know what caffeine does and we all know what alcohol does. And to me, you know, I never, the reason I dropped out of college was because I was struggling with English. So I actually went to Compton City College for a while and took my English there before I got back to Berkeley and on to medical school. So writing was not innate. Uh, it wasn't an innate ability. It wasn't a class that I took in college if I didn't have to. And in high school, I never read a book. I cliff noted all the way through it. So how I find myself here is, is, is as much of a mystery. But for me, writing is two components. One, writing is, you know, it's got to be authentic and it's got to be emotional and it's got to be true. And so what I do is, you know, on Sundays when I'm not working, kids are tucked in or they're at baseball, I'll have thought about a topic in my mind the day or two before, usually at night before I go to bed, sort of, you know, harnessing sleep and dreams a little bit about it, you know, rolling it around my mind for a couple of days, holding on to a couple of thoughts, disjointed. And then on Sunday, I'll have a beer and I'll sit down and I'll just write and I won't conjugate some verbs. I'll leave all the misspellings. It's a ton of red squiggles. I mean, it's, it's far from, you know, ready to be submitted to anybody. But the, the structure, the narrative, the plot, if you will, it is, is spoken with authenticity. It's sort of my energy, my feeling. Then I have an espresso and as the beer is fading, I go back and read it. And then I'm like, wow, some of this stuff is crazy. Some of this stuff is great. The coffee serves as sort of a lyrical or you know, laptop scalpel, then I go back and clean up the sentences. But beer, disinhibition of the ways we have already connected our thoughts, that allows us to generate new thoughts and new connections. And I think that helps me with the narrative and the plot of the writing. And then, of course, you got to go back and clean it up as far as language. But that's my method for, uh, you know, and partly how I wrote the stories in this book. So all the chapters open with what I call a hot open, which is a gripping story, you know, from the trenches with patients that segues into the topic. So those are all done on a Sunday with a beer and a coffee. Yeah, that's, that, that was really cool how, you know, how you do this one, two step to incite creativity and then you come in and clean up, you know, that's, that's, that's something cool because it is difficult to, to write, you know, it is difficult, you know, when you, when you uh, write a, a blog post, you start with, you know, looking at PubMed and then you, uh, you organize all of your studies to see what the studies say. And then I can just make bullet points and say, Hey, check this cool things out. And I, and I would geek out reading, you know, the methods and reading the outcomes and, you know, and all that. But that's not accessible to a lot of people. So now to create a compelling uh, story so people actually extract my point of view on these studies is difficult. Because the right part of the brain, which is the masculine part, it becomes more active <laughs> with caffeine. And then the left, which is more feminine, likes the alcohol. Is that right, doctor? <laughs> Here's your tongue in cheek again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's funny. But no, you, you know, just on that. If we just told you what we knew, it would be Wikipedia and nobody, we like it, we use it, but we don't like reading it. And I think whether it's oral traditions or the way our brain is structured or the way we listen, knowledge comes through storytelling and narrative. I think that requires more than just listing the content, you know, like attorneys would do with their documents. And the reason it's arts and sciences it's because when we write our grants to get funding to investigate Mother Nature, the scientific grants can be quite elegant and beautiful stories. And really, that's what nature is, right? It's this beautiful mechanism and set of laws and things that arise and things that, you know, are subject to demise of because they haven't survived in this environment. Like, there's a lot of epic storytelling in nature. So scientists are good storytellers. And I always tell people that, Scientists have to be creative. They hire PhD technicians to do the little experiments in the lab. But the storytelling, the understanding of mother nature is a very artistic endeavor. And writing to me, writing, science, surgery as a sculptor, you're working with your hands to shape something. These are all creative endeavors. And uh, for me, the writing has been most challenging because it's kind of like saying, like, this is how I feel. This is what I think. 
And in my practice in medicine, you're really there to receive other people's concerns and worries and questions. It's not really a place where you return them. Your energy is there with them, but you're not really exploring your thoughts in a public arena. And writing is exactly that. Hence the beer and the coffee. And then, and then you have a big disclaimer on your book that you never drink coffee bef before going into surgery. And why is that? <laughs> well, some of the operations are six, seven hours long, eight, nine hours long, and coffee is going to be gone for a while. And uh, you don't want the highs and lows. You know, a long operation is like a long, epic ballet. You know, you come in. Unlike flying, our dangerous parts are in the middle of the operation, whereas flights, you know, it's takeoff and landing. So you want to come in, you want to save your energy, get the patient position, start the incision. Things aren't risky at that point. So you want to have reserve, both emotional, psychological, energy reserves. So you're kind of revving up the first two hours and then you're in peak performance in the middle and then you're revving down. That, that's just not how coffee works. About a cup of coffee, I'd be you know, crashing in the, in the time I need to have the most focus. You, you don't want to have a foreign substance that you have to navigate along with your own concerns and responsibilities. I'd rather just be clean, straight, sober, let my own brain, chem, let my own brain drugs, that are, the ones that are actually inside my brain already, let them do their thing. I'm going to quote from your book because it's just fantastic. You say in your book, if the prospect of opening up someone's skull isn't enough to wake you up without a cup of coffee, then maybe <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> yeah, if you're not jacked for that, then you're not bringing <laughs> you're not bringing your A game for what they deserve. Yeah, that is just so honorable. You know, that is uh, that I really like. I really connected with that sentence because you know, I, I as a as a practitioner, when I'm seeing patients day to day. The day that I'm not jazzed about going to see my patients and, you know, a lot of unloading of emotions and, and concerns, you know, the day that I'm not jazzed about helping someone, that's the day that I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, or take a break or take a vacation or shorten your schedule. I know it's always not always easy to do, but I try to practice that. Now, what are some like woo things that you went in like super skeptical? Have you find anything there like, oh, that's just bullshit. And then all, and all of a sudden you start doing it and then it, it's like, wow, there is some merit to it. See, that's the whole point of this book is there's some stuff that sounds totally hippie. And I was in Berkeley, so I'm kind of a hippie. <laughs> totally hippie Malibu yoga studio you know, magic beads kind of thing, right? All the things that many people would disparage, yet some people get some benefit from. And then, you, you know, so you would think, well, this, this, you know, brain surgeon, his thoughts about meditation, right? Because it's completely nebulous because it's inside your head, you know, but, but it's an ancient practice with real scientific and anatomical basis, okay? Whereas... Things like your gut is your second brain, that's complete nonsense, and books have been sold on that. We cut out long segments of guts, and we reroute them for gastric bypass, and people think just the same before and after. The web of nerves in your legs and belly, they are servant to the mind and the brain. They do send some feedback, but long stretches of those can be cut out, except for one, this vagus nerve, this one that pops out behind your ear, and drifts down your neck behind your collarbone, hugs the heart, and goes down to the diaphragm. That is, if there was one anatomical feature, the mind-body connection. That is the one that Buddhist monks or deep divers, they think and they send signals down to their heart so it beats slower. I've seen this. I put the ultrasound on. You can measure it. Now, that might sound like baloney to some, But that is very much real. So could that help the rest of the world that has high blood pressure, that has high stress? Yeah. So that's a built-in medicine for you that through years and years of practice, you may be able to lower the stress level based on, you know, how much your arteries are squeezing, how much your nerves are firing in your body. And then the other one is you can do it and the technique has been established. Controlling your breathing will send signals back up to your brain and chill your brain out. And you're saying, okay, that sounds very casual. That sounds very like, you know, goop and pop medicine. No, but that one is true. And other things aren't. So you need somebody to call out which one is which. And we had this powerful study that I put in the book 
Sometimes kids, when we can't figure out where their brains are sprouting seizures, they'll come in, we'll take off parts of their skull, we'll put a little pancake grid on them, we'll put the skull back in, and they'll hang out in the hospital for a week because we're trying to figure out where is the seizure sprouting, where's the origin, where's the epicenter, if you will. During that time, the kids are bored, and we're like, hey, do you want to do stuff? And they're like, of course, I'm just stuck here. And some, so it doesn't hurt them. They're already there. They have been, kids and adults have done meditative deep breathing, and we are measuring the electricity in the anxiety regions of the brain cool off. So you've got brain surgery measurements as well as 5,000-year-old practice that come together. That is not baloney, and that's what people should hear more about. Um, so that's one where I think people were, would suspect, like, this brain surgeon, this neurosurgeon is not going to say anything good about meditation. Quite the opposite. And you don't need to get ripped off and spend a ton of money. You can get some basic apps to learn the techniques, and you can do it in the privacy of your own car and your own home. You don't have to go on a mountaintop or a Malibu retreat. Two things about that. Can we make goop an act- adjective? <laughs> As in, that's a little goopy. That's a little goopy, yeah. Uh... They should have like goop, goop myth busters, you know, <laughs> nearly all of them except meditation. And then second is like, even if you don't like, if you don't want to go into the science, if you don't want to, if you just want like, like a real life example, okay? People like Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, the late Steve Jobs, all of those dudes meditated. I think those those guys are probably busier than you, my listeners. And and if they're taking time to meditate, there's something that that is giving them an advantage that you might want to try. And you know, try it out, figure if it works for you. And I'm pretty sure if those guys are doing it, it's there's something to it. And you know what? I think that's a good point. You know, it's not like I tried it and uh, you know my life is still a mess. It's it's a habit you bring in, like it's stretching or you're binge watching at the end of the day because you want to forget about work. These are habits, and if meditation becomes a 15 minute habit over years, I promise you, it's not going to make you worse. I don't know how much better it's going to make you. Whether you hit the lottery or you're losing your house. It's going to be a positive add to your life, and it's free. When I'm talking to patients about meditation, what I tell them is that when you're meditating, you're trying to clear your brain, and you're effectively getting a thought, and you grab it, and then you are making it, like moving it around and making it disappear. Imagine if you're practicing this day in, day out, and now when you're faced with a tough decision, you can maybe be able to modify your thoughts and say, you know what, this is not important and you're going to have this exercise and this practice where you're going to be able to discern between thoughts. So, so, it's so I, would, a- I, would make it, I would make it even easier See, because I can't tell what's going on in my own head sometimes, let alone what people have in theirs, right? So what I would say is take it to the elemental level. Do 10 or 20 extremely slow long breaths to a certain cadence you can find online regardless of what you're thinking the slow deliberative deliberate excuse me meditative breathing will help your body and mind and that part is measurable that one you can say i don't know what i was thinking during this process but i did sit down and i did do this rhythmic deep breathing and that is a huge and awesome place to start that by itself what's going on in your head that's your own journey, but the breathing is something you can measure and, and you can, you know, you can get apps for that. And, and that by itself is, I think, a huge part of meditation is the, is the deliberate breathing. When we talk about things that might be a little bit quacky or a little bit hippie or whatever, it's that a lot of these things do come from some truth. You know, like, for example, when you say that your gut, as you said, can brain, well, your gut does make some neurotransmitters. So, so there is there is a little bit of truth, and it's really nice to just grab it and run with it. Like when, when people say, you know, oh, you know, your femininity or your being able to be romantic or whatever is controlled by this part of the brain and this part of it. You know, there is a homunculus in the brain that that kind of represents what parts of your body are, you know, where they cluster. And we take this very real thing, like the homunculus, and we run with it, the and map. now we're like. Yeah, this map, and then we run with it, and now the decisions of your body and your personality, it's, it's, it's housed in, in this part of the brain, and that's not true. You know what? That's, a, that's an excellent point. This, been a, this has been a fun conversation. So there are parts of the brain that are very specific for what they do. There is a little, 
you know, San Francisco Lombard Street strip that goes from the top of your head to your ear. It's wiggly. And if we tickle it, different parts of your arms and legs will move. So movement has a very clear ridge and map. Feeling and thought and emotion and dreams, it's like wildfire jumping all around. So it's, that's the thing about the brain is it wasn't like, our brain is completely different from other animals. It's, it's sort of modular. There are some basic features, like there is a spot that makes you breathe. There is a spot that moves your arm. Animals have those spots. Lizards have those spots. And then there are sort of additional layers on top of it that are more global and not local. Those are the ones that you want to biohack, if you will. And you don't need to have a shortcut for that. You can turn to basic things like exercise, sleep, and meditation. I know we can't always exercise. I know we can't always get some sleep and we can't always meditate. But those are the durable long-term hacks. You have a cup of coffee, sure, that's fine. You want to have some Adderall, you're a college kid, you think it helps you. I'm not going to weigh in too much on that. You want to occasionally, you know, smoke some weed or take some LSD because you think it helps you drop better. That's your own life your own decisions but those can only be sprinkled on and sort of long-term durable biohack is all those things that work for us to be at our sharpest hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years ago hunting surviving coming together right those periods of food scarcity and i don't mean poverty i have a lot of respect for the poor and the famine that exists in this world but you know this intermittent fasting and not always having food three times a day the brain sharpens with a little bit of hunger it switches from using glucose which is sugar to something called ketones it's got like this it's like a hybrid vehicle and it, it, it likes to run both fuels and there's real science behind that there isn't real science behind carbs and paleo and all these different diets but intermittent fasting Weight loss is up to you how you want to handle that. That's just got calories, uh, but eat less. But for cognitive performance, intermittent fasting is your biohack. It's not fun. It's not easy. It's not putting a sticker on your head and watching TV. But that's the thing that's proven. And it's got, again, historical basis for that as well as a scientific evidence for that. And, you know, historical, you know, cultural, every single religion has some sort of fasting, you know. Uh, so it is something that, that through spoken word, we understood as being beneficial. It has come down from our ancestors, and it's in some sort preserved and revered, you know. I think the problem is that in our mo modern environment with our shitty foods, most people can fast because they experience hypoglycemia, they are not metabolically flexible, and they become hangry, <laughs> and, now, and now they can't think. It goes from hunger being this motivator, you know, to go search and forage, you know, because if you were hungry and, and you got hungry, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't have evolved, you know, so hunger it's an incentive you know you get in and then different things happen not only in your brain and all your body some apoptosis mechanisms start happening and you know but that's for a different type of doctor we're, we're talking about the brain and the, the brain does want to have that metabolic flexibility and working with the ketones and working with the glucose at, at the same time it is true that there is like a very specific requirement of glucose that the brain needs per day but, you know, that can be done by breaking a little bit of protein or using extra glycogen. It's not necessary. If you need to eat every three hours, there is something wrong physiologically, and maybe you need to do some fasting to fix it. Yeah, and so that hangry is funny. It reminds me of the Snickers commercial. Yeah, <laughs> if you got hangry, you, you're less likely to actually find food if you're not focused and calm under stress. So that point there is good. And then there's this thing about like brain food and this food and everything food. And well, you know, I don't experiment on animals, but there was this experiment done decades and decades ago. And they took blue dye and put it in a mouse. And then they dissected the mouse. And the mouse was blue everywhere except in the brain. The brain remained white. Despite the tons of blood flow it gets, it gets, it's only three pounds and it gets 20% of the blood flow. So it's got its own barrier around it, and most of what you eat can't get in. So when people say brain food or brain inflammation from your gut inflammation, there's a lot of loosey-goosey science and connections there. So I always tell people, you know, you are not what you eat because what gets in the brain 
is highly restricted and not just to protect toxins from getting in, but the foods you're eating, the proteins and the carbs and the fats, they get broken down into their building blocks, amino acids, glucose, and only select things are let in. It's a highly regulated environment. So you can't just go to the shelf and see something that says, oh, good for your brain. I'm not even sure what that means. But that, again, gets a lot of traction. Okay, another another uh, tongue in cheek. But what about natural substances like bacopa? <laughs> so I'm a naturopath. Okay, I am an evidence based uh, naturopathic doctor. I do a lot of evolutionary medicine, you know, and and I look at this evolutionary basis for things. But within naturopathic medicine, you know, we're exposed to all of these different quote unquote holistic things like Chinese medicine and things like that. And and there is something called the, the- theory of signatures. And it's like things like, oh, you know, we look at the ginkgo biloba leaf and it looks like a brain. It must be nature telling us that it's good for the brain. And it's natural, so there's no side effects. Is it? it? Well, hemlock is natural, so it's poison ivy. <laughs> but, Arsenic, you know, you can find it elementally in water. Yeah, so I'll tell you, I'm completely open-minded about this topic. I take care of cancer patients. Many of them eat you know, medicinal or not medicinal, marijuana, chocolate. Many of them meditate. Almost all of them pray. These things are basically, you know, certain way of thinking can actually change the way your brain functions. It can release, prayer can release calming chemicals in the brain without getting into the specific biochemistry. Marijuana can help with certain uh, issues of existential crises. So there's actually like a major cancer centers. I don't know if it's peyote or mushrooms, but psychedelics to have patients deal better with the fact that something inside them, that their body grew, sprouted something that's killing them from within. That's a crisis sometimes if you just zoom out and look at that. So we, because I'm a surgeon, I'm not opposed to that. And on a real life example, I just want it to be done thoughtfully. And I don't want people to only take medicine that is reported to not have side effects and avoid something that could help them. So back to Steve Jobs, he had that rare kind of liver cancer that if you cut it out, you can actually be cured. Many can't, but that one was the one where surgery could have, you know, then he got a transplant, different things. So again, if it gets in the way of good medicines that's out there, even though it's synthetic or surgery, which is completely synthetic, uh, if you will. I don't want naturopathic options to get in the way of that. So just be thoughtful about all the things. And to show you how open I am to that, my son and I were in Bolivia. Just uh, He's 17, but we were there before 14. And the altitude is real high. First thing we did we got there was have some coca tea and, <laughs> and put a bunch of coca leaves. You know, coca is not cocaine is what they'll tell you. And they're right. You know, we put a bunch of coca leaves in our mouth. And the ingredient in that plant. The insecticide. <laughs> yeah, the insecticide or I don't know about evolutionary biology as much as you do, but I think some of those chemicals may actually seduce animals to eat and then poop out the seed later and further. It's not always it's not always a repellent. It can be an attractant, you know, so we that coca we've we've evolved with coca leaves. We have chemo, we have receptors and antennae inside our body that morphine, cannabinoids, these plants have chemicals that lock and dock like a perfect fit inside us. So for thousands of years and maybe longer, we have evolved, we've grown eating them, spreading them, being damaged by them and benefiting from them. And so the coca leaf example that I give you is, you know, that's naturopathic. That's embracing what plants are. And then I always tell people, I'm a surgeon. I'm totally pro nature and plants. The original medicines like aspirin are from plants. The, you know, the Peruvians, when they first tried to perform surgery, would spit, you know, coca leaf spit, if you will, right into the wound to numb it and patients all got infected. So to me, there's this great intersection between nature, surgery, science and medicine. And to me, they're not mutually exclusive. I just I want people to be smart about all the things they do to themselves and their body. I, you know, I had a person ask me uh, yesterday about Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and I was like, you know, we, we can use hormone replacement, thyroid replacement, very inexpensive, very effective to get those levels normal. And someone comes on, you know, uh, with the Q and A, and they say, you know, is it possible to get off of it? And I'm like, well, 
yeah, if you're sleeping 12 hours, if you, you know, if you have some food allergies, if you're not eating that stuff, if you have any nodules or anything, if they're not being active, or you can take this tiny little pill and then if you have to go to a party, you then whatever, you know, you don't have to be as neurotic about it. And I tell my patients, you know, don't measure your health by the number of pills that you take. Measure your health by the ability of you loving people and, and doing things that you love. You know, like, for example, with uh, within my endocrinology practice, we have seen a couple of parathyroid, you know, uh, hyperparathyroidism. And the answer for that is surgery. And there is no plant, there is no diet, there is no, you know, that is going to solve that. And it's okay. We have the technology, you know. It, I, it drives me nuts when people say, oh, you know, we are the only mammal that drinks milk. Well, we're the only mammal that drives cars and wears pants. So we use technology to our advantage. And if it can help you have a better life, you shouldn't feel less than because you had to have surgery or you have to take a medication. Yeah, I think naturopathic treatments are not well covered and well presented in hospitals. We need more of that. And I do think that sometimes surgery and medicines are just given out too quickly to keep the, you know, sort of the medical and surgical complex rolling, not from some sort of, you know, industry like the banking industry, but patients come to you, these are the skills you have, these are the skills you offer them. And all by, you know, for the most part, it's been a great advance for society. But yeah, some I do know surgeons and doctors who don't as they should because they're not really trained in them. So hopefully the current medical training is including more of that. And hopefully the government will, you know, reimburse hospitals for those sort of approaches as much as they do for the invasive stuff. So I'm totally open to that and really enjoyed your perspective. We, you know, we're like five minutes away before finishing, you know, I'm so thankful for you giving your time. I know how busy you are. Can you quickly tell us about traumatic brain injury and what can we do if it happens to us and how to recover for it? And then we'll, you know, let you go because I know you're super busy. No, it's been a great conversation. It's perfectly timed. I'm driving into work to to take care of a patient with brain surgery and the LA, LA traffic and commute is perfect for a long time. It's like a pendulum. For a while, we were pretending it wasn't there. Uh, we never pretended with boxers. We knew when they got knocked out, that was bad for them. <laughs> but then football players and other people, we said, oh, they just, they got their bell rung. And we sort of, Stinger. I don't know why we never connected it. Yeah, we, we, you know, we know boxing is bad for the brain. Why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't a concussion in football be the same as a knockout, you know, in the boxing ring? So somehow... The sports world separated that in our minds and it was a mistake. And as we have learned more through imaging and patients passing away, uh, traumatic brain injury is to me in two buckets. One is the stuff I see, gunshot wounds, things going really bad, piece of the skull off. And, you know, that's that's not what we want to talk about here. That That's addressed in the hospital. But it's the uh, importance to know that the brain can handle a few bumps, but it doesn't like being bumped over and over and over again. If I told you, why don't you knock your knee on the wall 20 times a day, four days a week for 10, 15 years, he said, no, it's going to mess up my knee. But we let kids and college players bang their heads often for decades at a time. And I don't think it should come to a, as a surprise to anyone. That's not good for you. So the disease that you can get with it, among many other things, but the one that's got the popularity is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Either way, the word is chronic. It's not from one concussion. It's from repeated concussions. So the most important thing, I've got three teenage kids. Have fun, play sports. And you can't tell, who, you know, uh, exactly who's going to have a concussion or concussive effects, but have fun, play sports. But you can't really be doing stuff where your head gets knocked around a lot. And so... If you need sports, if you want sports, if you feel differently, all I would ask parents and people to say is put it in the same risk as boxing. So, yes, kids are allowed to box. Boxing is an Olympic sport. I watch boxing. But we never lie to ourselves and say, yeah, that's not going to hurt our kid, right? So don't lie to yourself and say that tackle football is going to be just fine. Or some people are saying heading the soccer ball. And the evidence for that is less clear. But people are trying to figure it out. And 
if you are going to play the sports, the structure should be that you can't rely on parents and and coaches to pull the kids. You know, you kind of need an independent person. And we went to Samoa where they generate a lot of football players. It's hard to have the uncle and the coach take you out of a big game, but that needs somebody on the sideline that is not that invested in the outcome of the game and more on the kid because it's the second knock, it's the third knock. And if you get the second concussion on the same day, you can get some really bad brain swelling. So it's preventing the repeated head injuries. We, you know, kids fall off the, you know, out of the crib, they fall off the counter. They can handle that. But the repeated knocks, there's, it's undeniable that is bad for the brain. Like you said, you know, it's, it's undeniable. And sometimes, you know, I can see how that could be the kid's future. And, and someone, you know, is like, maybe if I make a play, if I score, if I'll get a scholarship and then I'll have financial security for the rest of my life. So how can you rely on the coach or the uncle or even the kid itself to make that decision, you know, especially because, you know, sport, we grow up idolizing sports stars and we want to be like them and they and do something heroic, selfless and above our physiology. And and that's where we can get in, into, into a lot of trouble. Yeah, but no judgment on my part. I just want people to know and then they can do what they want. I tell my kids, you're allowed to make bad decisions. You're just not allowed to make uninformed decisions. And that's the thing where this book is about is I'm just putting out there the best I know uh, about the brain from multiple perspectives. And when we learn more, we'll put that out there. But this is kind of what we know now. And that's, that's legit and reliable and fun. What a fascinating conversation, you know. It, it, it's so awesome to talk to someone that is putting their neck out there, you know, and saying cool things that might make people uh, think twice about <laughs> uh, about what, what they're reading, you know. How can people get a hold of you? Do you have a website, a blog? You know, tell us a little bit about when your book is coming out. In America and UK, I don't have a blog. I don't really have a website. I do local television here in KTLA in Los Angeles where I have conversations like this, but in three and a half minute blocks on air with uh, with the anchors and I get to choose my topics and such so either way just I wish everybody the best and I'm not saying I know everything I'm just uh I'm just putting out there what I know and if it's useful go for it but don't just trust me you know do your own due diligence you know I wish you guys the best and thank you for taking the time to talk to me awesome can you say when the book is it cut off and I, I want to make sure we get it there June 4th awesome awesome well Dr. Jandiel Thank you so much for your time. It has been fascinating. I can't wait for my listeners to get your message and, you know, go go ahead and buy that book. It's amazing. I got a pre-copy. Uh, I just like sat down last night in between talks and I was just consuming it because it's just so engaging and, and a lot of myth busting. So that's that's the type of stuff that, you know, that we like to be exposed to. Thank you so much and I'll talk to you soon.